What is political power and how important it really is? Today it is said that power is the currency of politics. But it was Machiavelli who back in the 16th century separated ethics from politics and shifted the focus of political science to the study and management of power, a feature that's more relevant today than ever before. Hello friends, I am Raman Bhutta from News and Statics and in this episode I bring to you an analysis of political power, its different forms, theories and expressions in our society. So without any further ado, let's begin. Machiavelli's book The Prince is considered as a handbook for aspirants to political power. It is here that Machiavelli advised the prince to contrive some way to win the love of his subjects but not at all at the cost of losing the opportunity to instill fear in them for they will love at their own will but fear at the will of the prince. Mao Zedong claimed that power flows from the barrel of a gun. Karl Marx believed that power of the proletariat should be expressed as a violent revolution. Mahatma Gandhi on the other hand saw power in ahimsa, the force of non-violence. But Machiavelli was in between seeking to exercise power with love and kindness if possible but if necessary with an injury that leaves no scope for revenge. That reminds me of Cotillia's words that it's better to completely destroy one's enemy than to disrespect him and let him off. It seems that the Italian Cotillia was similarly apprehensive of an enemy's wild revenge. It's now important to understand as to who wields power who owns power in a society? That depends on the governing apparatus of the state. If it's a capitalist society, we can have two types of states. One is the negative liberal type which believes that man is prior to the state and so the state should have minimum interference in the affairs of the individual. The government should ensure law and order, defense and rules for a level playing field and fair play. But that's all. The game should be ultimately played by the private players in a free market economy working within the boundaries of fair competition and equal opportunities. Adam Smith had said that the state should act as a referee rather than as a captain. This view started becoming popular after John Locke propounded his theory of natural rights and social contract. And even more after Adam Smith introduced the concept of the invisible hand way back in 1759. But the industrial revolution of the 19th century changed the perception among political thinkers. When they saw private capitalists exploiting the working class to maximize profits and a minimalist state not interfering to stop this exploitation, they called upon the state to positively intervene and to ensure that the rights of the individual are preserved. Thus was born the concept of a welfare state practicing positive liberalism. T. H. Green, the father of positive liberalism, believed that since the state was the foremost organization in a society, it is the duty of the state to ensure that the rights of man are preserved. For that, the state must provide adequate affordable health care, education, safeguards for minorities and other disadvantaged sections of people, subsidies, affirmative actions, unemployment compensations, labor laws, and so on and so forth. Well, are you imagining a socialist state? You're right. This is a direct transition from a negative liberal to a socialist state. Today, there is hardly any state in the world which is purely negative liberal. Positive liberalism is practiced to varying degrees in different parts of the world. Now note the shift in power during this process. In a negative liberal state, it seems that the government has minimal power and the capitalists and business owners have a large degree of power. But if you carefully examine, you'll understand that the government still has the power to sanction for violation of laws, which is a game changer. Using this power, it can ensure that no enterprise or business house is growing by unethical means or in violation of competition rules which may hinder the rights of those small entrepreneurs who want to grow as per their talents. 
Thus, there would be, as Napoleon once said, a career open to all talents without distinctions of birth. This ensures that a sizable fraction of indirect power is vested in the hands of common people who may want to open their own enterprises tomorrow and in the hands of the common consumers for whom a fair competition among the providers of goods and services is the best safeguard against breaching of their rights. But this roughly fair distribution of power in a society is in fact a utopia which can only happen when government is perfectly exercising its duty of making and enforcing laws. In practice, this is not the case, which is why the common man asks for additional social welfare because he knows that the law of the land is not enough to ensure his well-being. Just imagine an entrepreneur in some country who had to close down his e-commerce startup because the predatory pricing by other e-commerce giants wasn't properly checked by his government, which made his business uncompetitive and unviable. Then of course, he and many others like him would demand unemployment allowances or pension schemes from the state. Thus, it is very common for a negative liberal free market economy to morph into a positive liberal or socialist state, which is usually less efficient. And the reason why it's less efficient is because it gives the government too much power and makes the common man who otherwise could have happily lived off his own talents dependent on the state provided handouts. Well, this disbalance of power is the cause of inefficiency. Karl Marx in the 19th century came up with his own formula. Marx suggested that power be distributed throughout the working class. He envisioned a stateless society because he understood that this imperfection of the state and, uh, would, would not be solved and he regarded state as an instrument of exploitation of the masses. A radical view, but then every man is a child of his times and so was Karl Marx who saw the exploitation of workers by factory owners right in the height of industrial revolution. Karl Marx desired a society wherein exploitative power ceased to exist. Later in the 20th century, a Canadian political thinker, C.B. Macpherson, would advocate for minimizing extractive power of the state and maximizing the developmental power. But you see, the point which both of them missed is that power cannot be so easily divided like this into different watertight categories. Wherever there is power, there is misuse of power. And notwithstanding the noble intentions, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. This is why the British introduced the post of a district judge way back in 18th century India. Because at that time the collector owned huge magisterial and judicial powers which seemed too much for a single person. Now, in the quest for providing an alternative for the utopia of a liberal state, Marx devised his own utopia of a communist state without suggesting the nature of decisive leadership which will be required to transition from the present liberal to the future communist state. This void in Marxism was filled up by Lenin when he violated the basic tenet of a stateless society by creating an all-powerful state in the name of a vanguard communist party, a concept which was considered as a temporary bridge to transition into a stateless system but has hardly any intention of being temporary in any communist regime of the world. In fact, Marx would have regarded the phrase communist state to be an oxymoron. Under Leninist strategy, the formation of a communist state involves replacing the bourgeois state with a party whose top brass wields all the power. Thus it is merely the replacement of one minority by another minority. The minority of the bourgeois party is replaced now by the top brass of the communist party and the democratic labels being a farce. 
In fact, democracy can never be realized in any organization. It is never the majority opinion which prevails, but the opinion of a minority of handful of oligarchs which occupy the top positions in the organization. This is Duverger's law, iron law of oligarchy, which again shows that in practice how difficult it is for power to be distributed evenly. You see, not just in any society, but in any organization. I believe many of you who are members of some large organization can relate to this fact that it's only a handful of people at the topmost rungs of the organization who actually have their plans implemented. Others can keep having their opinions, it won't matter. But in, it is in this respect that one can appreciate the genius of thinkers like Antonio Gramsci and Michel Foucault. Gramsci explained how soft power lies with the civil society, with the professional associations, NGOs, labor unions, voluntary groups, media, etc. How the activities of these organizations shape public opinion and manufacture legitimacy for the government in the minds of the people without resorting to coercive force. Foucault also believed in the multifarious nature of power, stating that power is everywhere and comes from everywhere, that it is far more distributed in a society than previously thought of. Whew. Well, few would deny that power holds the same position in political science as money holds in economics. Therefore, I can speak about it for hours and hours together and yet barely scratch its surface. For now, let me uncoat this dissertation with an analysis of Max Weber's definition of power. You see, Max Weber said that power is the capacity of carrying out one's will despite resistance. Despite resistance. In other words, he didn't consider it as an expression of power when some work is done in the absence of resistance. It was the genius of Machiavelli who advised his prince to ruthlessly use force only as a last resort and to try to be humane and circumvent any resistance otherwise. Most people seem to take note of only the former point and disregard the latter. But Machiavelli showed how anything which helps in achieving his target is in fact an expression of his power. Well, that's it for now, friends.